Joining me now to share his insights on the USCCV full meeting is Bishop Thomas Paprocki of Springfield, Illinois. Thank you for being here. He joins us from Baltimore. Your Excellency, I want to start with the document on Eucharistic coherence. We've been talking about it really for weeks now, if not months. Last summer, there were some bishops who feared the document might be used to rebuke Catholic politicians who are in favor of abortion rights. Now there's an already existing document on the Eucharist that the USCCV wrote in 2006, and there's canon law. Uh, both clearly state who is and who is not to receive communion. What does this new document provide that the bishops and the Catholic faithful didn't get from the previous iterations? I think this new document complements what we've said before in 2006 and also what is contained in Canons 915 and 916 about the, uh, who should receive Holy Communion. I, I think uh, it's important to correct a misconception. This document was never intended to be uh, primarily about uh, p politicians receiving Holy Communion. Uh, it was uh, in intended really to be uh, to give an understanding of uh, the Eucharist. Uh, from what the polls tell us, many Catholics don't understand or don't uh, believe what the, the Church teaches about the real presence of our Lord in the Eucharist. So there is there's a lot in there about that. Uh, but there are sections in here that do talk about uh, the issues that uh, are sinful that uh, could affect someone's um, uh, eligibility to receive Holy Communion. We quote uh, Pope Fra Francis, who talks about the throwaway culture and specifically names uh, the unborn who are unwanted and the elderly who uh, also uh, uh, tend to be uh, unwanted in many cases. And, and then we do talk specifically with references to those documents from 2006 and uh, Canon 915 and 916. So it's important to understand that the uh, uh, Bishop's Conference, for one, doesn't have any authority to say who can or cannot right. receive Holy Communion. That really depends on the individual bishop in his diocese. Uh, the, the bishops overwhelmingly voted to accept the document. Two, 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 222 in favor, eight against, with three abstentions. Uh, hardly any bishops commented on the document, however, at least during the public portion of the conversation and debate. However, Bishop Joseph Strickland of the Diocese of Tyler, Texas, did have something to say. The scandal factor is uh, quite significant, and to really address that more than just mentioning it, I believe is um, very beneficial to the faithful and to helping really promote this beautiful document on the Eucharist and really emphasizing the beauty of the real presence of the Lord among us in the Eucharist. So I just ask for further consideration or reconsideration of that number 16 regarding scandal. Why wasn't there more debate, uh, Your Excellency, on the document in public, particularly since at least part of what informed this conversation was public confusion and scandal caused by prominent Catholic politicians? Well, I think we had a very contentious uh, meeting in June uh, when we were first discussing whether or not even to draft this document. And I think there was a sense among many bishops that we wanted to avoid uh, being so contentious about this. I also give a lot of credit to uh, Bishop Kevin Rhodes, the Bishop of South Bend, Fort Wayne, uh, Indiana, who was the chairman of our uh, Committee on Doctrine. I think he did a lot of work uh, behind the scenes and worked very quietly uh, talking to bishops and, and uh, working with them to see what would be acceptable. And I think the fact that it received uh, almost a unanimous vote is a real credit to the work of uh, Bishop Rhodes and the committee to to arrive at a consensus over something mm -hmm. that uh, that uh, was very contentious in the spring. Yeah. Your Excellency, for the last 25 years, I've watched these documents come and documents go, um, and and there's a little skirmish in the media over the debate, and then the documents fade away. But the fact is, the issue, the underlying issue here, does have effects on souls, on individuals, and certainly in your diocese. Last week, America Magazine published an interview with Senator Dick Durbin, a pro-abortion Democrat uh, from Illinois, in, from your diocese, where he complained that your diocese was uh, being 
uh, quote, unfair to him, fundamentally unfair, and singling him out by denying him communion for his pro-choice stance. Now, you and Bishop Kevin Van in California wrote a response to him this week, correcting him. You write uh, that he's not being singled out because of his opinion. Why is he being denied communion, Your Excellency? Uh, he's being uh, uh, singled out, in a sense, uh, because of his actions, not, not his opinion. So, uh, Canon 915 talks about th those who obstinately persist and manifest grave sin. So, he's, uh, through his uh, legislative act actions in the U United States Senate, he is actively uh, promoting abortion. And so, uh, that was one um, error that we tried to correct in our uh, response in America Magazine. The other one is that he tries to uh, uh, to equate other issues, uh, or, or equate or even say that they outweigh. So the fact that uh, he promotes mm -hmm. legislation to to help the poor and to help migrants. I mean, those are wonderful things that our conference agrees with. But uh, mm -hmm. you can't say that, well, because of all these other good things I do, that we can just uh, sort of give him a pass on the fact that he's uh, very strongly promoting abortion. So I think it's very important to correct those kinds of mistakes. Uh, uh and, and Bishop Oprocki, you have spoken directly to Durbin. You had the, the much discussed but seldom utilized dialogue with uh, Senator Durbin about his views and, and, and why the communion is important, what it means. Um, he considered it just a matter of conscience. And he, he said in his uh, interview, well, if one has a conscience, and I have a Catholic conscience, that, that should be good enough. Why is that not correct thinking? Well, because I think sometimes people talk about conscience in terms of rationalizing uh, what they want to do. And uh, the, the criteria for whether or not someone should be admitted to Holy Communion are very objective uh, standards that can be observed by others. So uh, that's important to understand, too, that a bishop is not uh, making a determination about the status of one's soul uh, or one's sinfulness be before God. Only, only God judges the individual person. But it's in um, and, and the situation where you have someone whose actions are considered to be ex uh, externally gravely sinful, that's the criteria for which uh, a bishop has to act. And so, um, you know, that's basically what uh, we've done here. Also, I would say, yes, I've had those uh, conversations not only with Senator Durbin, but uh, I'm the bishop of Springfield, with it, which is our state capital. I've also had those conversations with some of our state legislators. Uh, but I would also uh, say that in terms of the dialogue, you know, the bishops often get criticized for not dialoguing. Uh, first of all, I'd say there is more dialoguing going on than people may realize. Uh, again, this is often quiet and behind the scenes. But I would say that, unfortunately, in my experience, it's the, uh, it's the politicians who really don't want to dialogue. They're just uh, uh, very much uh, dug in to their pro-abortion uh, stance, and there's just no give on that. Well, that, that, that's why maintaining the status quo is in the interest of the people trying to teach in place of the bishops, frankly. And, and so they, they love things to remain as they are. Um, Your Excellency, the bishops are planning a Eucharistic revival with three years of Eucharistic processions and adoration prayer events all over the country. Now, this Eucharistic revival will culminate in Indianapolis in 2024 at the Eucharistic National Congress. Your thoughts on the plan for this Eucharistic revival? Well, I think it's a wonderful plan. I, we're going to have a, a parish-based uh, celebrations of the Eucharist, uh, we, and we'll have a diocesan uh, Eucharistic Congress, and then there'll be this national uh, Congress, as you uh, mentioned, in Indianapolis in 2024. I think that this Eucharistic revival should also be seen in relation to the document that we were just uh, talking about. Because if, if we're going to revive something, the question is, what are we reviving? And so we want to make sure that people have a good understanding of what is the Eucharist. And uh, particularly with, with young people, uh, that they uh, really understand the importance of, first of all, of the meaning of the Eucharist in terms of the real presence of our Lord that we receive, uh, the body and blood of Christ in the Eucharist, but also the importance of, of going to Mass on Sunday. Uh, that that is something that is it's, it's key to our identity as Catholics to, to celebrate our faith. So uh, I'm very encouraged by this. I'm glad that uh, so much of our conversation this week in Baltimore focused on the Eucharist, the meaning of the sacrament, and um, 
and who should receive and the proper preparation to receive the sacrament, but then going forward from here to have this uh, Eucharistic revival, which I think the timing is good, because uh, as you mentioned earlier, sometimes you know, we bishops work on documents and then they wind up on a shelf and don't get much attention. But the fact that we are heading into this three-year revival means uh, I think there's going to be a lot of attention and a lot of uh, talking and hopefully celebration about the Eucharist in the next three years. No, no. So vis visible signs that people can see and touch and experience, that's where it's at, culturally and otherwise. So I'm, I'm, I was heartened to see that response. It's so much more. It, it animates the doctrine, which is what's needed, because these politicians are otherwise the only animators of a very confused version of that doctrine. Bishop Thomas Popraki, thank you for your time and, uh, and for your insight. God bless you.